Well, so I, I, left, uh, I left MIT in uh, 1987 to take the directorship at uh, uh, Tufts New England Met Medical Center. And I was also uh, given a faculty appointment as an associate professor in the Tufts uh, University School of Veterinary Medicine, which was, uh, which was delightful for me. And it's, it was an interesting, it brought some interesting closure. One, uh, of course, I was recruited by Dean Lowe to come to Tufts University. And uh, Dean Lowe was a close friend of uh, Dr. Ben Cohen, who was my mentor during my postdoctoral training at the University of Michigan. And uh, Ben, as I mentioned earlier, was a very unique figure in laboratory animal medicine in the United States. He was the uh, creator, really, of the first laboratory animal training program, uh, along with uh, one simultaneously, Tom Clarkson at Wake Forest. But Ben developed the training program uh, at the UCLA and then quickly transferred it from there to uh, the University of Michigan. Ben, along with uh, five other, four other veterinarians in the Chicago area are credited with being the founding group of the American Association for Laboratory Animal Science, ALAS. Uh, ben was a, uh, Ben argued to the American Veterinary Medical Association that laboratory animal medicine is a distinct uh, it, it's a distinct academic side of veterinary medicine that warrants specialty designation. And uh, the American College of Lab Animal Medicine was established then as the second recognized specialty in veterinary medicine. And Ben wrote the uh, letters and served on the committee which convinced a small nucleus of scientific organizations to say ALAC, intern, ALAC is a, an, an appropriate, the peer review process of ALAC, which was then the American Association for Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care uh, was developed as a, a vision of Ben and close working colleagues as a mechanism of peer review for laboratory animal pro research animal programs uh, here in the United States and of course now internationally. So he should be credited with, uh, uh, with much. And as I mentioned, he, he argued that we shall do protocol review if we're going to ethically sign off every year on our, our uh, annual form to the USDA, and that was in place in 1979. So uh, a very, uh, very profound uh, accomplishment, I think. Um, so I, I was at Tufts for seven years. I left Tufts then in late 1994 to go to the University of North Carolina. Uh, and uh, in doing that, I uh, I, I met my one key goal, which is to have a surgical facility which is under my control and not under the control of the Department of Surgery. And I had a lot of other challenges because uh, the uh, University of North Carolina was, I think it was in the top 10 in terms of uh, biomedical research funding at that time or, or very close to it. So it was truly a research powerhouse. And of course, by this time, there were many other changes that were occurring in the field you know, transgenic uh, technology in mice had become well established. Uh, organizations were dealing with the explosion of rodent, the use of rodent models and development of rodent models. Um, North Carolina had a, um, had a very active program there. They had a number of um, very well-known uh, investigators, uh, including Oliver Smithies, who later won the, uh, won the Nobel Prize for uh, the homologous recombination approach to uh, to uh, transgenesis in mice. And, and actually, a number of his, of his students had stayed on there as faculty, and there were just a number of other uh, faculty coming into the, into the uh, program. This was also during the time when the NIH was in the course of, uh, double, had committed to doubling the budget over a five-year period of time. And uh, the program offered just terrific support to, to me, and that made really all the difference in terms of recruiting a good team uh, for running the program and in working with the investigators and the institutions to develop the institution, there were uh, a couple of facility renovations and new facilities being developed, uh, all of which had to be equipped and programs had to be established in them. And uh, that was really easy to do when you went to a place that, uh, that had an established um, oversight process and had a, a, a strong functioning uh, IACUC, it had uh, institutional commitment, and, uh, and it had the collaborative spirit, um, both from the, uh, the scientific side and the veterinary side. I mean, there was a good working relationship uh, in that organization, and it, it really, uh, I think, helped them achieve uh, quite a bit during my tenure there. 
Um, and so I spent from uh, 94 until almost 2000. I graduated my children from uh, high school. My wife and I became empty nesters. Uh, both my wife and I were professionals. Uh, and we were quite satisfied there, but we did begin to think maybe one more move might be in our interest now that we were empty nesters. And that, uh, that prompted me to then uh, look for other opportunities. And uh, I was attracted to the Washington, D.C. area. Um, actually, I wasn't, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't the primary person to move to that position. It was actually my wife who had become uh, as uh, one of the senior leaders within the Howard Hughes Medical Institution was offered the position of a, the senior director's position for research operations at Howard Hughes. And so she went to uh, the Washington, D.C. area while I stayed at the University of North Carolina for a year. And we would commute back and forth in our uh, dual professional marriage. Um, but we had made the decision that we were going to make one more move. And as it turns out, her opportunity preceded mine. But I knew there were good opportunities in the Washington area, um, specifically one which I eventually took. And that is I, I took then a year later the position of senior director of the Veterinary Resources Program at the NIH. <clears throat> and uh, that was a very uh, attractive position at a very, again, another very supportive institution. It was very, it was unique because just within my piece of the, <clears throat> excuse me, just within my piece of the Veterinary Resources Program, there were 16 veterinarians. And then in the broader campus, there were close to 40 veterinarians involved in the activities uh, on, that, on that campus. And um, I was brought in more or less as the, you know, one of the senior leaders of that entire uh, veterinary uh, cadre. And the NIH was a, a very well organized uh, structure. Or, or, Although I, I will say this, that there are so many bright people within the NIH and within the federal government that to get any good idea out of the box and to fruition, it has to go through, many, through so many tiers of intelligent review by people that want to have some impact that things seem to take a, a, very, uh, a very long time. But we had a very high functioning uh, ICOC, uh, very, really top-notch programs run in a very, uh, a very professional way and using very contemporary standards. Uh, so that was very gratifying. But I did uh, certainly truncate my potential tenure there, leaving it only in, only in two years. Uh, the reason being that uh, after you spend, I had already spent nearly 25 years in academic environments. And after you've had the, free, the, scho the scholarly freedom of an academic environment, where you're expected to contribute as a, a speaker doing independent research and collaborative research, as a participant in the programs of other organizations, uh, that just, the viscosity of doing that was so difficult in the federal government. The number of interviews, the number of forms, the waiting for approval, the tedious questions, uh, it just, it didn't become uh, an attractive environment to work with. So yeah, two years had gone by. Uh, I looked at, uh, was looking for another opportunity, or had another opportunity, and that was to take the, the position as uh, associate provost for uh, research animal resources at Johns Hopkins University, um, or as I truncated that title, um, associate provost for all things animals. And uh, that was, of course, um, the number one fund. It has been the number one or one or two funded biomedical research institution. Um, for a very long time, probably decades. So it was a, a research uh, powerhouse uh, and had a lot of dynamic research going on, a lot of interesting challenges uh, because the program there and the facilities there, they had, they had sort of fallen behind the times. So they were, they were quickly working to catch up and building new facilities, which they, which they did actually just upon my arrival. But there were a number of things that had to occur to adjust to that new reality and to those new facilities, and a number of uh, tensions which had to be uh, had, had to be relieved from the compression of research and the competition for space and 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 getting your ideas played out through the use of animal models. So there were some interesting challenges uh, to uh, uh, to that era, many of which played out through the institutional animal care and use uh, committee uh, process. But that was, at that point, a very 
uh, vibrant process and a very open and active uh, discussion of issues. The other um, thing I really, um, w in, really enjoyed being involved with while I was at Tufts was to be uh, sort of an adjunct to the center, uh, the, uh, the Hopkins uh, Center for um, Alternatives to Animal um, Testing. And that was a, a program that had a, a long and storied history. Um, but it had sort of fallen into a bit of a, a lull in terms, I think, of its, of its influence because the, um, they, they, they did not have enough resources to be active as a, a, an, an active uh, grant giver to, prom to promote research in the development of alternatives. That had fallen into the hands of, of other groups in the United States. And for the most part, I think there was not, there was certainly not a visible national funding for that, uh, which probably was a tactical mistake for the national government. But there was private funding. But the, but the private funding and the outcomes of those studies remained invisible for a large part. There were only, I think, probably only a, a small part of what was actually accomplished in the development of alternatives was expressed in a public way so that we could crow about it and say, we do believe in this, and we do believe in the three R's. And um, so a CAT, in a sense, had devolved into more of a, a, a discussion group and a cheerleading role, more than a, 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 a true catalyst and a resource to uh, powerfully promote their mission. Nevertheless, they had a great heart. And uh, insofar as I could play a role in the small grants they did, did give, insofar as I could play a role in, uh, in, in learning from the speakers, bringing speakers in to, uh, to discuss important issues as it relates to refinement, replacement, and reduction, and other issues related to the animal welfare themes. It was, it was really very, uh, very rewarding, and, uh, and I think very beneficial for, uh, for that community. Now, there has been a resurgence and perhaps a redirection in what CAD is doing. And I, I think, as I understand it, there may even be some more development there, which is going to be very positive. But that was, that was very gratifying. And, um, uh, and, it, and it highlighted, and there's, there is an irony in this, too, I think, linking back to earlier in my career. You know, as a, a postdoctoral uh, scholar at the University of Michigan, I sat there in our small specialty library at lunchtime, and I would browse the various books from the history of laboratory animal medicine and science off the shelves, one of which happened to be uh, Russell and Birch's uh, book. And so I was aware of the, uh, the issue of the three R's um, even as I, even as I uh, went into my career. And there was really not much discussion in the rest of the laboratory animal community about the three R's because it really wasn't until the, sh the spotlight was shown on that by virtue of the regulatory change. But it was, it was interesting in that, it, um, it, it, uh, that it, it, some of the older guard, including my mentor, Ben Cohen, were very skeptic about even expressing alternatives and the, uh, and the three R's. And the reason for that was that uh, we were all acutely aware of the fact that we were being attacked from the outside and that people were trying to trivialize what research is accomplishing. And they were trying to um, uh, you know, sway the public opinion that research can be done without laboratory animals in a way that was, um, it, it was underhanded. Uh, it just you know they weren't really they weren't saying the facts they were they were uh, they were playing to people's uh, emotions uh, and uh, and frankly they were uh, they were in a sense winning the battle they were swaying the public and um, so you know there was a great sp Ben uh, uh, several meetings stood up and spoke uh, against Andrew Rowan at meetings saying that you know you're 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 trying to you're trying to pull one over on us here. With, uh, with this hyperbolic view of how trivially we can drop our use of animals and move on in other uh, types of scientific inquiry to solve all these complicated problems. Um, and uh, so, of course, later in my career, uh, you know, I, I, I understood uh, and the, the, the polarization is something that uh, it won't go away by itself. It will only go away if those of us who are capable and willing to work uh, without that polarization in the middle to talk about the realities of what 
the three R's can do for us and alternates can do, and, uh, and try to engage the other side to admit the realities of what animal research has done for us and what animal research, uh, what it still must continu continue to contribute until there are better alternatives. Um, you know, if people won't talk in that middle ground uh, about, the, about the actual facts, uh, then, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll be to the detriment of our ability to accomplish what we would want to accomplish in, in science. What prompted you to leave Johns Hopkins, which, as you mentioned, was the number one or two grant recipient, uh, NIH grant recipient, and which, as you noted, was a very exciting and rich place for your work in both lab animal medicine and with CAT as the, the organization that was working to develop or at least um, have a stake in the alternatives in 3R's domain? Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned, so as a, even as a, a postdoc, I was in the environment where ALEC had been created by Ben Cohen. Uh, Dan Ringler, my, uh, my a direct mentor and lifelong mem mentor, uh, who was a professor at uh, the University of Michigan, was, had been the uh, chair of the Council on Accreditation in ALEC. Inter at ALAC. So uh, he, the, certain, the visibility of that organization was, was quite high for me. When I went to MIT, Jim Fox, another terrific mentor, uh, said, Chris, I, I, I want to promote you, and I want to, um, I really want to try to encourage you to play a role in ALAC and participate as an ad hoc. Am I willing to do that? So again, back to a theme I raised very early uh, with you. Um, I think many of the things which I've been able to achieve in, in my career have been, because I've been privileged uh, by, uh, by others um, reaching out on my behalf to open doors for me. But anyway, I, 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 under Jim's uh, tutelage, uh, I began to work as an ad hoc site visitor for ALAC back in the mid-1980s. So uh, by the time the ALAC position became open when John Miller retired, I had already had about 25 years of experience with ALAC, both first as an ad hoc and then later as a member on the Council on Accreditation and terminating as the Vice President of the Council on Accreditation. I had lots of field experience. I had met many organizations, many places which I had site visited. Uh, I, I felt that, that ALAC was a really important organization uh, that in so many ways promoted uh, the quality of laboratory animal care raised issues of the ethics and the use of research animals. It was, it was just a very unique experience. And then, frankly, I guess I would say, having already been in um, four of the nation's top research institutions, uh, research powerhouses, really, um, you know, I, I didn't really see where I could go uh, in those environments that would be any different. And so it, there was a certain repetitiveness to fighting the tough battles for 30 years. And you know, I saw the ability to lead the ALAC organization as a, a real fresh change in a career and a change that would both bring me, uh, you know, it would be gratifying and be, would bring me a great deal of, uh, of challenge. And uh, I thought I could do a lot to reach out to that community, to engage the ALAC community and those who are not in the ALAC community to make them appreciate that um, animal welfare really counts, and ALAC is a great way to express that. But if you don't want to do ALAC, we are still willing to, to, to help you understand what you need to do to be a fine uh, organization. Chris, you have, as you just noted, been at some of the foremost, if not the four foremost, or four of the foremost research institutions in the country. You have crossed many rivers. You have such a long view of this field. How has the role of the attending veterinarian evolved as the animal care and use field itself has changed? Well, the, yeah, the attending vet veterinarian has really evolved uh, dramatically because they've been given a position by virtue of the, uh, the revisions in the regulations. Remember, as I said earlier, the attending veterinarian, uh, you know, really worked at the, 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 the beck and call and according to the, the latitude that the scientific community would give them within the institution. And there were institutions which gave no latitude, were not uh, collaborative and collegial in their Outlook, uh, and you know, the veterinarian was was really very constrained. I mean, there was an era, and there were many institutions in which the laboratory animal veterinarians were were simply regarded as the paper signers because that's that's about all they did. They did things on paper, but they did not do things in reality. And so, um, you know, that really began to change quickly within organizations. Uh, again, um, with 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 different. Um, 
levels of uh, uh, progress according to the, the philosophy and the psychology and the personality of the organization. But, but at least on paper, there was now a process, and veterinarians have inexorably fought within institutions to, to get a, a fair shake of what they need to have in order to know that they are meeting their ethical commitments within the institution. So um, I, th I think the, the grand difference has been that at one point, we had a sense that there was an ethical commitment, uh, although there was not much discussion about what the dimension of that was pre-1985. But even if we had a sense of what the ethical commitment was, there was certainly no assurance that you could express that ethical commitment. After 1985, there was a growing sense of what's expected uh, with broad public discussion. And there, were, there was a system of support that could help veterinarians uh, help veterinarians evolve, and uh, and as I mentioned, I think ALAC played an important role in that because as ALAC site visits programs, if it sees dysfunctional programs, uh, it can cast the spotlight on the critical pieces that need to be improved so that so that the attending vet can achieve uh, what they need to achieve. I've heard many anecdotes over the years about the inherent conflict that exists at many institutions between a lab animal vet's role as facilitator of the research, i.e., your job is to make sure it happens, mm -hmm. versus a lab animal vet's role as the protector of the animals. I'd like to hear your view as to what the current state is, circa 2014, of this dynamic tension as to what constitutes adequate veterinary care in most U.S. institutions today. Yes, it's very interesting. Institutions have their own particular personalities. In some institutions, the scientific staff is, is very uh, collegial and collaborative with the veterinarian. And if the veterinarian happens to have scientific interests as well, then that is a really nice match because the veterinarian can play, can, can play an active role working with scientists and be visible in the promotion of science in that regard as well as uh, the running of a top quality uh, program, which, which, uh, which certainly promotes animal welfare and assists science in, in general. Um, then there are other programs which have the profile that um, the, 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 they value what the veterinarian does. The veterinarian may not be involved in science, but at least they value what the veterinarian is doing uh, to promote the welfare and health of the animals and the, and the efficient management of the program. And in programs which are appreciative of the veterinarian um, per se, as the veterinarian, that can also be a really uh, highly functional and satisfying uh, arrangement for both uh, the, the scientific uh, enterprise at the organization and the veterinarian. But the problem occurs when there are organizations that don't have an appreciation for the veterinarian, or they expect the veterinarian to participate in science. Uh, and the veterinarian, sometimes some veterinarians uh, aren't capable of participating in science. Some veterinarians, frankly, don't want to participate in science. They want to just be too regulatory in their outlook. Uh, and so this then creates a, a conflict with the the faculty, and it's um, you know, it's it's sort of like the small wound uh, becoming a big wound by virtue of scratching it too much over and over. It just the agitation level because of the mismatch in in, in uh, personalities and in approaches uh, can be a real impediment to both uh, providing then a good a quality program of veterinary care and in providing a, a program of veterinary care that's complementary to making uh, uh, a good progress in science. So, you know, I think in the ideal circumstance, uh, if, a, if a veterinarian wants to succeed, they certainly have to express their broad appreciation for science, if nothing else. I don't believe in all programs that's going to be a guarantee that they will succeed, because there are still some programs where, um, although many things have been surrendered by, the scientists feel they have already surrendered so much by going through all this extensive paperwork, uh, to be able to do their work, but they still haven't surrendered the underlying personality that they are operating a higher tier, um, and uh, they're just not going to appreciate things which which don't dwell in that in that higher tier. Those are environments where which are uh, they're uniformly tough for the veterinarians that take on those positions, uh, and those are some of the toughest and and frankly they're some of the most interesting challenges that are out there for the veterinarians that want to take those on. The cautionary note being, of course, that 
uh, to the scientists. There aren't really many. There aren't really very many veterinarians that want to take those on. And to the veterinarians, um, beware of what you think you're you're getting into. I mean, you you think you want it, but you may find it's tougher than you think. So it takes a unique person to function in those kinds of environments and uh, and pull off the the transformation that's required. Yeah. And although I won't. Well, I, I, I've, I've had a sense, as I mentioned in my own career, of where I've hit a limit and not been able to make that next transformative step. Uh, and that's caused me to seek other, other positions. And um, I, I think as people look at veterinarians moving around the country, you oftentimes can see that they've hit the same spot. Building, uh, building a really robust animal care and use program, um, it, it goes well beyond the mere uh, satis satisfying the regulatory demands of the program. Uh, it really is the development of this broader, broader ethos and bringing the collegial spirit into the program. I mean, uh, the, committee is, is, the committee is formed of a diversified uh, mix of people, and the expectation is, I think, in that, in that committee is that they that uh, that they represent their community, but they create a new community, and this is a this is a community that sees not uh, not personal and individual advantage, but sees the development of this uh, intellectual and ethical milieu, which is really uh, transparent and transformative, where the committee is willing to take on any topic in a fair uh, you know a fair and independent assessment and uh, use the resources at their disposal, both you know, the objective scientific facts about it and the, the ethical principles, uh, high ethical principles that drive the institution, and an appreciation that there are people who stand outside the institution who may not have a background in ethics, they certainly don't have a background in science, and they are looking at what the institution is going to do. Is the institution going to keep a credible image in the in the public's eye, and and a, a really well functioning program is is really appreciative of that that uh, that total environment internal to the organization and external to the organization that it's working in, and uh, and they work in this cooperative spirit to achieve that. And when when you hit the critical mass in an organization like that, then suddenly the people who are um, aberrant in their uh, approach and narcissistic in their needs become the true outsiders and uh, and you know are easier I think to either transform into being a good member of the community or, or you know are ostracized to some other institution so a high functioning uh, program uh, it, it radiates this uh, heavenly union what do you see as the continuing barriers to reducing the numbers of animals used in research today? And if in your response you could uh, specifically address the issue of breeding colonies and whether those are in fact contributing to high numbers without perhaps a corresponding benefit. Well, if you look at large animal use, the, those numbers have, have really, um, they've declined over the years in, a, in sort of a, a straight line and, and fashion. And the use of large animals is, um, I, I think science is driving those numbers in a, in a way uh, that's very different than it's driving the numbers in the, in the rodent side, which I'll get to. But I think, the, the, I think that really science and cost is driving down the use of, of large animals in a, uh, in, in a progressive way. Where the question has come up in the uh, public's mind in uh, rodents, there is, a, there's a, I think, a legitimate criticism of the, um, there, there, certainly there was a legitimate criticism of uh, the large numbers of animals that need to be used in the production of the un animals which have the unique genotype that's of interest scientifically. And um, especially in the early days of uh, transgenic colonies where, where um, investigators learned about uh, the development of transgenic mice, but they may not have had huge expertise in maintaining the kinds of colonies that it takes to, uh, to uh, develop these animals and then to support the animals to generate the ones which, which are genetically interesting for scientific studies. And um, as a result of that, there were really huge colony sizes, and it was very difficult to tell whether it was relevant to have all those animals 
or to not have those animals. And that, that discussion replayed itself in institution over institution. One of the results, one of the very positive results out of that, and of pressing investigators continually on justifying their numbers, um, was that in, investigators began to look more critically at what the people in their laboratories are doing, and they began to look at the costs associated with using those huge numbers of animals. And they uh, at least began on an intermittent, perhaps sporadic basis, of, of uh, pushing their staffs to keep those animals at a minimum. Now, that still wasn't entirely effective, and the reason why it wasn't is because a lot of times their staff they may have had good intention, but they, they themselves were not necessarily particularly well trained. And the really interesting thing that, which now has happened uh, is that this has become um, entrenched enough in the, in the broad discussion within the industry that when the guide was rewritten, there was a recommendation in the 2010, eight, the eighth edition of the Guide for the Caring of Laboratory Animals, suggesting that uh, those people who maintain um, large rodent colonies for the purpose of, of genetic, uh, uh, generating genetically interesting animals, that those people should have, uh, you know, a training and education in proper colony management to minimize those numbers. The other thing that the continuous discussion has done and the, comp and the need for space so that others can do their new creative ideas in some new animal model is that institutions are beginning to realize that you know, there's a, there, it's not, well, not only costly to keep them on the shelf, it's, there's potentially a jeopardized to, jeopardy to the animal and the future of the animal. If there's a c catastrophe in the institution and something happens and the animals in a room die, then you lose that valuable line and you have to start over again. And so that prompted people to get animals out of the cage and back stay, stored as frozen embryo or as sperm. Um, and, uh, and that's really improved the circumstances quite a bit. And so it's been, it's been a combination. It's been the fact that the IACUC uh, would relentlessly ask this nuisance question, as, as perceived by investigators. And then it was the fact that they responded somewhat reluctantly and then with more sophistication within their own staff. And then there have been all these technological developments which can reduce the numbers of animals uh, on the shelves. And I would note that that's, even, uh, that's, that's become even, even more true. It's now so easy to develop a transgenic mouse that people are willing to do the study and then retire the strain or, or remove the strain, knowing that if they ever had to get back to it for scientific purposes, they probably could find it elsewhere, they could regenerate it. And then here, just within the past few, few months, there's been a whole new, there have been new technologies to develop transgenics, and some are so quick, easy, and accurate that um, it's going to be trivial for investigators to get the genetic model that they need. So it's, it's a problem that was uh, solved first by uh, nagging and uh, then by science. I'm going to switch gears for a moment. The war of public opinion is an ongoing one. Why, in your opinion, has the scientific community been so passive or even reluctant at times to explain to the public what they do and why it matters? Yes, I think that the question of really the scientific disengagement and the education of the public is um, it's pretty appalling. And it's one of the features which um, has bothered me throughout my career. Now, I was introduced to this idea um, uh, really not uh, from, from within the context of my career. I was introduced to the idea in you know, reading the old literature and reading about uh, luminaries of the time going around the country giving town hall, intellectual town hall discussions as a way of engaging the public. So you look at uh, you know, people like uh, uh, you know, Emerson uh, or, or more on the, um, uh, the uh, celebratory side, um, uh, uh, P.T. Barnum. You know, those people had a, a public presence. They were recognized people. They were philosophic people. And um, you know they would go around the country and lecture to the people. I don't know what happened to that. Uh, you know that that whole trend in the United States seems seems to have uh, died. So um, in a nostalgic way, I have this image that maybe scientists should be doing the same thing. Well, you know, as a young veterinarian in the Massachusetts area, and then throughout my career after that, I've worked closely with the state organizations to go out and talk to. Uh, you know, uh, high school advanced biology clubs and, you know, universities and, 
uh, middle schools, grade schools, to, you know, let the kids know why animals are used in research. And there have been times when actual scientists, uh, when I did it, I did it in the sense of my own science and so far as I could, but my science is a, is a thin page in the, uh, a big library. Um, and the question is, who is representing all of the rest of that library? The answer to that is, well, it's typically not the scientists that are doing that. They're really reluctant. They're, um, they, they're acting as uh, a detached insular elite. And um, that, to me, is very, very troubling. I have felt throughout my career, but more recently, lately especially, that one of the things that the public really doesn't appreciate about science is that experimentation is not always productive in the way we hope it to be productive. Um, the public, I think, would have a high support for science if it behaved in the cartoon that they expect. And that is, you know, you put one block on top of the next block on top of the next block and you get this progressively higher, uh, higher tower. Um, that's not the way it works. Science is... Uh, is more like uh, you know, giving children a handful of sand and tell them to throw it to create a pile. Some of that sand sticks to the top of the pile. The rest of that sand becomes the angle of repose. And the pile eventually gets higher and higher. But you don't get the top of the pile without everything on the side. So we, as a public, fund the scientists to do science. And we know, scientists know, there's what, I don't know, a 30, 40, 50% success rate in the hypotheses they test. And the rest is just the fabric that's holding the center of the pile. So if the public doesn't understand this, and if the public doesn't understand science, how can scientists expect them to fund science in America at $31 billion a year? That's just the biomedical science. I think, I think the question goes beyond that to science much more broadly. I mean, if you're funded by the public to do engineering science, this, that, or the other science, whatever you are doing, if you're doing it with public money, I think there is an obligation to be the town hall speaker talking to the public. And, um, you know, it, it just hasn't worked on a volunteer basis. There are, uh, there are not that many scientists willing to take the time to do it because they are busy and overcommitted people. But um, that's not the only mechanism. You know, you you could ask others in your laboratory to do it. Or as, as I have said in several audiences, and I don't know whether I've ever said this at a primer meeting in front of primer audiences, you know, it's my belief that really um, the requirement to do that should be linked to funding. And so you know, if you look at just a simple metric, going back to just the NIH, if you tell an investigator, if you get a million dollar grant for every $100,000 in that grant, you or someone in your laboratory is going to give a one hour public lecture of any dimension, a radio show, a Rotarian club, a high school class, whatever, one hour per $100,000. So they are committed to 10 hours a year in their laboratory. And um, you know that converts a $31 billion budget to 310,000 hours of public education. So w would we ever see that? No, we see you know, minimal, minimal scientific uh, expression uh, and interaction with the public. So, the, the journalists have done a much better job, and scientists are much better about talking to the big venue uh, sources. But it's only the it's only the fabulous studies and the studies with uh, glitz. It has it has to it has to meet sort of the the journalistic patina, which, as we all know, is getting increasingly distorted in in, in our age. So so all this other great science that is the basis, you know, that buttress on the angle of repose. There's no discussion of that. And the public needs to know about the whole process. Scientists need to step up to the plate. What has most discouraged me in the course of my career is that there, there do seem to be institution which, institutions which, by virtue of their, uh, their approach, their philosophical approach and their history, uh, they, 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 they are, it's, they're very difficult environments for um, rigorous and enduring programs to survive. They, they have lapses in their programs, and I believe it's by virtue of lapses in or organizational attitudes which radiate from people very high uh, in the organization. So that's, that's sort of a key point, and that is that you know, the, an, an organization's uh, um, 
history uh, is, is very enduring unless top leadership is willing to make the commitment to, to make that, uh, that change in the, in the organization. And that's a very arduous process. And, um, it, and frequently, it doesn't occur. There may be motions that direction. But if it's not a strong motion, and if it's not, if it's not held long enough, there's, there's, not this, uh, there's not this frame shift in, in, uh, in thinking in the organization. And that leads to a relapse. And uh, that, to me, is very sad, because it's not unusual that these organizations are typically also, also research powerhouse organizations. And so some of the best research is being done there, uh, but sometimes under the most uh, problematic, potentially problematic uh, conditions that lead to, to exposures, which don't just hurt the integrity of that, uh, that organization, but they, they more broadly than hurt the, uh, the, the feelings the public has about science in general. Um, the things that have kept me going personally are that uh, on an individual basis, person to person, and on an institutional basis, so many programs are able to make adjustments and really change. And really, uh, they understand uh, and have incorporated it into their, into their fabric that, that times have changed with regard to how animal research is conducted, how animal research is perceived, and they're, they're uh, open and transparent in what they do. They're willing to reach out uh, to the public in a significant way. And they're willing to address the difficult issues that come up when there are problems with interpersonal relationships within, uh, within organizations. And, and it's, uh, it's interesting. This takes me back to the beginning of my career when I came to MIT. I thought it was quite unique. I was interviewing for a low-level administrative staff position as clinical veterinarian. But in the course of that interview, uh, Jim Fox arranged for me, my mentor and, and, and director there, arranged for me to meet Paul Gray, who was the president of the institution. So uh, as a new employee in what they felt was an important enough niche to the institution, I had a chance to sit down and speak with, uh, with Paul Gray. And that epitomizes the kind of an organization that is willing to stand up at the very top and say, we're going to do it right. That was really that really impressed me, so that was that was great. Now, um, the third question: What hasn't changed, and what could change? The th it's it's changing. In fact, this primer meeting was really um, really buoyed my spirits because the um, the recent revisions of the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals have added a new highlight to the importance of training. Here's the issue for me throughout, throughout my career, is I've seen indiscretions done in animal research, which have been numerous and varied at different places. They almost always result not from somebody's maliciousness. Um, they result from their arrogance of thinking that they know enough to do a procedure the right way. I mean, it's actually the interaction with the living animal that causes the problem. And you know, typically, they're undertrained or have been ill-trained by a a, a method that's you know a laboratory to laboratory training method, or it's just some method which has never had the independent certification of. I'll return to it: the contemporary veterinary approach, or contemporary three R's approach, or uh, you know proper modern technological approaches. So they're doing something that's either improper or antiquated. They're uh, allowed to do it, and it results in a, a poor outcome in the uh, in the animal. So, I mean, the solution to that's very simple. The guide for the care and use of laboratory animals has had the term, you know, training should be provided for years. But th they've only slowly ramped up the rigor of that. And I think the, the recent guide is, um, has, has much more, has, sets a much more stronger proposition about the importance of training. And uh, I was delighted to see here at the primer meeting that, that all the individuals that were speaking on the panel talked about training in the context of proficiency. That you know you need to document proficiency, and um, I was very pleased uh, four or five years ago when I was more heavily involved in uh, the ALAS organization and its leadership that the position statements of that organization uh, re with regard to training were were rewritten to sort of insert and fortify the notion that we begin to look more at proficiency. And if you look at all the recent renovations or all the recent uh, revisions in the regulations, the CEOMS principles, the, um, the OIE, uh, Terrestrial Code for uh, Laboratory Animal Welfare, and the guide, they're all beginning to incorporate this notion that we can't just say 
you're responsible for doing training and everyone should be trained because it just doesn't happen magically. It has to happen through a process that's documented and certified. And if we do that, it, it, it would have been a, uh, uh, a paradigm. It's a paradigm shift that is a, a decades overdue. I have been so struck during the course of our conversation by how many mentors you have cited. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're a mentor to so many as well. People are standing on your shoulders now. If a young lab animal vet came to you and asked you to tell her or him what you consider to be the key elements of an ethical, scientifically responsible, and humane animal care and use program, what would be the standing on one foot or Cliff's Notes version of your advice to her or to him? Well, I, I, I think with regard to really a, an organiz, organization functioning at a high ethical level, it has to radiate from the very top. So the individual who's at the top of the program has to understand what's going down at the bottom end of the program. And they have to, uh, they have to make sure that, that, that the mechanical pieces to achieve that and the authority and the responsibility down the chain of those mechanical pieces uh, is in place. And they have to radiate high ethical standards and, um, and th that has to be transferred, again, down through that chain with an appropriate understanding at every level for what their, um, for what their area of authority is to, um, to interact and implement programs which are ethically designed, you know, ethically conceived, ethically designed, and, uh, and ethically implemented. And I think if, it, if, it any, if it any link in that process um, there's a, a problem in the, in, the, in the transference of that, uh, that ethical approach. I, I would and I have advised many individuals who I tend to refer to as friends and not, not mentees. Uh, I, I've advised them to stay away from those kinds of programs. And it's very important in going into a program that you certainly need to have your, um, your, your authority recognized and your ability to transform that which is beneath you. But you also need to have the ability to have your voice heard fairly and independently above if there's a problem above you. And not many programs have the, have the upstream uh, capability to this day. What fuels you? What springs, internal and external, keep you so uh, passionate about your work? Well, I, I, came into, uh, I came into laboratory animal medicine, and uh, I came into my professional career as somebody that's really dedicated to science. I mean, I, I believe science is really in, an important uh, transformative force for uh, not just for our, our, our health, but it's, for, it's a culturally transformative force. So I think that science is something which is supposed to serve us, and it's supposed to serve the people. And... Um, in order to, to, um, to aid the science being effective in that regard, uh, we have to understand that science is the creature of people. Um, and it's been pointed out to me on a number of occasions that people are uh, a very diverse group and uh, they don't often interact well and they require coordination and inspiration. And I've always felt it was a bit of a challenge to work with people to try to get them to, um, to work towards a common goal, that goal being, let's do this for science, because in doing that, we're doing it for people and, and the world around us. So I, I think um, I, I would credit uh, a, love of, uh, a love of science and getting back to something I uh, said very early in the interview on another topic, uh, belief in people as their own independent ability to shape a positive future as what's driven me. You are a change agent, and you are an opinion shaper. And if you could have one or two waves of a magic wand, I would love to hear your answer to the question, if only I could do these one or two things to change the course of lab animal medicine and animal research, mm. what would your if onlys be? Well, I, I must say, I think that um, lab animal medicine and lab animal science has been on a good independent track, uh, and it's, it's going in the right direction. If, if, if I had been asked the question, or if, if, you're, if you'd pose the question retrospectively, what might we have done? 
we we might have done a the government might have done a active uh, infusion of money into the funding of alternatives. The issue is this: that science is good-hearted. Science is is naturally uh, reductionistic and using Occam's razor. They're always looking for the most simplified way to answer a problem, and I, I think there's a natural tendency for scientists to to uh, to do things in ways which use fewer animals, use animals more effectively, um, and so forth. But because it was not funded as an, as an open um, activity, what has occurred there has been sort of under the radar screen. I mean, there's been a lot of good progress, which has been invisible. And I think if, had it been visible, we would have been able to crow about it. I think there might have been a lot more progress in that line. Uh, and, um, and I think there would have been a better buy-in of the public on scientists and the intent of scientists. So um, ag again, scientists fought tenaciously, don't fund alternatives because that's just another roadblock in the way of our progress. And I think that science made a, an error in